This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 30, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, this coming session's budget is a big fork in the road for the governor. Second, as push comes to shove, the Alaska Policy Forum seems to be siding with the top 20% on the PFD issue. Third, the Permanent Fund Corporation lays out its agenda for this coming session. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. He's either playing Poncho to my Don, or he, I'm playing his Poncho to his Don. I don't know which one it is. It's Don Quixote and Poncho Sanza as they continue to tilt against the windmill of government spending. Uh, I don't know, Brad, did you ever think that six years ago this is where we'd be saying, I told you this, you damn kid, six years ago, you just listened to me, it would have been all better. But I mean, that's kind of how I feel this morning is that we've been warning about this for the last six years and individually on our own, we've been warning about it for, you know, 10, 12, 15 years. And uh, yet nobody seems to listen. And there's now is not even any certainty that there's the political will to get it done now when our backs are literally against the wall. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. I, I, I was in a debate the other day and I drug out the 2012 article uh, op-ed that I did in the Anchorage Daily News saying, you know, the, 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 the day is here. We have to we have to start cutting spending. And I remember how much, you know, how much pushback I got on that when I when I wrote it. Oh, no. You know, there were people who were still going, we need the Matsu rail extension. We need the connect arm bridge. We need, you know, we need this. We need this. We need that. Um, and I got, you know, piled on in 2012, I wrote that piece saying, oh, you're just, you're, you're a doomsday, doomsayer. You don't know what's going on. You don't understand, you don't understand economics. <laughs> and now, and now some of those same people, uh, who were saying, oh no, we've still got money to do the Matthew rail extension and other things. Some of those same people are now saying, oh, you're just, you know, you, you don't know what you're doing because you're saying that, uh. That, uh, that that the political will to do these spending cuts are, isn't there. Of course, we got the political will to do it. It's just uh, it's been a wild ride over the last few years. Yeah, it sure has. Well, let's dive into it uh, this morning and get things uh, get cracking on your weekly top three since we got a lot to cover. Uh, the election's over. Uh, we talked yesterday about the governor's budget and kind of the choices that are laid out before us. And you know, but the bigger question is, what does he face with a split legislature, both in the House and the Senate? What say you? Well, I I don't envy the governor's position. I, I think I think his hope uh, and the hope of many was that this election cycle was going to give him a legislature, essentially to go back to his 2019 his initial budget package that was a package of of deep spending cuts and uh, and some revenue shifts, uh, upstreaming revenues from from local government to the state government. I think I think his hope. I think the hope was that he was going to get a legislature that was allow that would allow him to go back to twenty, uh, the twenty nineteen budget, uh, and push for it. Now, the perspective people need to keep in mind the perspective. The twenty nineteen budget had about a billion dollar package between spending cuts and revenue shifts. Had about a billion dollar uh, billion dollar package of, of reducing uh, the cost or increasing the revenues uh, to state government. Uh, and that was at a time when the the deficit was plus or minus uh, plus or minus in that range. Today, going into this legislative session, the, the deficit is 2.4 billion dollars. People people haven't fully comprehended what the what the drop in oil prices uh, did to did to the revenue side. They're still sort of, still sort of stuck back 
in the 2018-2019 time frame of $60, $65, potentially up to $80 oil, um, uh, and and sort of thinking through, uh, you know, still applying that time frame. But oil prices have dropped. He's facing $2.4 billion deficit. But at least the 2018 package, the initial budget package, would be a step in the right direction, and and you'd have to deepen it uh, significantly, but you'd have to deepen it to sort of get to the same, same place. He, that that package, though, takes a combination not only of spending cuts, but also but also revenues, uh, uh, the the revenue shift, and that revenue shift takes a, a legislative majority uh, in your favor uh, to pass it through. I think that I think the the hope going into this election cycle was that he was going to have that legislative majority to do sort of things that 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 would include um, uh, uh, potential. You know, taking PCE potentially, uh, uh, you know, shifting those revenues from from uh, uh, local government, the old property tax revenues from local government to the state. The reality is, uh, at the end of the day, he's not going to have 21 plus 11 for those sorts of things. He's not going to have 21 in the House plus 11 in the Senate uh, for those sorts of revenue uh, uh, things. The reality also is he has he has a core 16. A, a better core 16 coming out of this election because some of the red districts went deeper red. You know, you look at John Coghill, uh, uh, right. Rob Myers. You look right. at uh, Kathy Geisel, uh, Kathy Geisel's loss. You look at Chuck Cop's loss, and 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 the and the people who are replacing them. It, he has a better core 16 needed to uphold vetoes, uh, via spending vetoes. He has a better core 16 than he had before. So. Here, here's sort of the, the the playing field he's going to be he's going to be playing on. He can make he can likely have legislative support the 16 he needs for deep spending cuts. He's not going to have the 21 plus 11 he needs for the add-on package uh, on on the revenue side. So what he's facing is does he go with the deep spending cuts that he likely has support for? Um, uh, and, but, but without the revenue side, or does he, you know, throw the revenue side in there and just, you know, not, not be able to pass it, but does he go for those deep spending cuts knowing he has 16 behind him, uh, or does he do what he did last year, which is sort of not try anything new and just sort of have a, 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 a regular budget, a, a, a normal budget, uh, that we've sort of come to over the past decade, but he doesn't have any revenues to support that. So how does he? How does he? How does he propose to, to pay for that package? Um, it's a it's a it's a hot, it's a very difficult situation. If he goes with the 16, you know, it, we've talked on previous shows. My inclination would be to go with the 16, have have the 16 or the 20 that he likely has core supporters for spending cuts stand behind him when he does the budget to show he has that he has that ability. Uh, and then negotiate from that position of strength. Negotiate for things that he wants, and on the revenue side, and negotiate for the things he wants on the spending cut side from the position of strength. Does he do that, um, uh, or does he does he come back to the to the 2020 budget? The one th- the one downside, and the thing that will the thing that 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 uh, 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 narrows him in on on going with the with that veto package going with the the 16 standing behind him or the 20 standing behind him uh the one thing is the recall i mean if if, if he does that what's going to happen if he says i'm going to cut you know a billion dollars out of the or two billion dollars uh out of the out of spending because now's the time to do it that's what voters wanted you know citing coghill citing Giesel, citing cop citing johnson i'm going to go with that package um, and and I and here's the people who are gonna gonna be with me on it. Uh, does he do, if he does that he triggers recall. He triggers you know people getting all excited about recall again, and he and he loses any hope uh, uh, if there is any of having uh, a majority Republican or well of having a, a a a strong Republican majority in either body because what will happen is the is the is sort of the the moderate Republicans. Um, uh, in the uh, uh, in the in the in both the House and in the Senate, will join with the Democrats in a coalition, and you'll have coalition in both bodies. So, does does he go with that with that strong spending cut package, or does he go with a with a 2020 package? Maybe if he goes with a, a 2020 package, 
uh, you know, Steve Thompson uh, uh, and other moderates in the in the House uh, will will join with the other Republicans in the House and have Republican uh, majorities in uh, Republican strong majorities in, in both bodies. But but what does that achieve for you? Yeah, you got Republican strong majorities, but you're not going to get the spending cuts you need, uh, and you're going to have to face the the revenue side. How are you going to pay for all this? So it, it's a it's a tough dilemma. I mean, the, the the hope was he didn't have to face this. The hope was the outcome of this election cycle was uh, was he could go with the the 2019 uh, package and he'd have uh, majorities in both bodies to support him. It's just not going to be there. So it's a it's a it's a tough dilemma, and and I don't think the administration. The signals I've got is, is the administration hasn't figured out uh, which way uh, it's going to go yet. Uh, right. But it's going to it's going to be a tough tough situation. Well, and I said yesterday I wouldn't take you know that I wouldn't take a bet either way that it could go either way. In my opinion, it could be a 2019 or a 2020 style budget. Senator Showers was of the opinion that he's expecting more of the 2020 style budget, which would be unfortunate. Because I think as goes the governor, you know, that he's he's the leader. He's the one that's steering the boat. He's the one that's got to kind of set the tone for what's going on. And as you said, hanging on to those 16 and letting the chips fall where they may may be the only way that we get uh, any kind of substantive change on it. And, of course, it comes back again to the political will of these people. Do they have the political will to stand in the face of what's going on? You know, many of them ran on uh, a balanced budget and yet still having a full PFD, which is – kind of at odds with each other right now the way that the legislature factors the pfd and the budgets and everything else because they're so closely tied instead of being separate and so it makes it uh, it makes it even more difficult for them yeah realistically i mean i you he may say it he may put it down on paper but realistically you're not going to have a full pfd if you don't uh, if you don't go with a, a deep cuts budget um uh, you can, I, the, the revenue i mean to keep in mind a two point four billion dollar deficit. Uh, if you don't make deep cuts uh, to get to get that deficit down, deep spending cuts to get that down, you're just going to need a, a boatload of revenue. Uh, and uh, and you know we'll talk about this more in the second segment. But you're not going to have a whole lot of support uh, for for uh, other taxes. Uh, and so what's going to happen is the pressure is going to be on on using deep PFD cuts or deep PFD taxes. Uh, uh, to be that revenue, so it, it's he, he's not. I mean, he's at a he's at a crossroads. Right? Does he want to preserve the PFD like he like he did, uh, like he said he did in the in the campaign? Then he's going to have to go with deep spending cuts. Is he going to give up on the PFD, uh, uh, or at least uh, uh, create the situation where the PFD is going to is going to be deeply cut not only now but into the future because these these deficits don't go away? Is he going to is he going to create the situation where that likely occurs? Then he's going to go, uh, the, and that's going to, that's going to be the result of going down the the 2020 budget road. So, it, it's a it's a big crossroads for the or a big fork in the road for uh, uh, for the governor uh, in in how he's in, in what he's what he's going to do from here forward. We'll ask some questions here. Um, does Brad think the governor has the authority under emergency powers to change budgetary items unilaterally, spending formulas, et cetera, too? Question mark. Um, I don't know what Brad thinks. I don't think he has the authority to do that. I don't think he could do it under the cover of of this emergency power. But Brad, what are you what do you think in your reading of what's going on? No, he doesn't. Yeah, I mean, I, he has he has the veto power. That that's the power he's got. But he doesn't have the power to 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 you know to use revenues that by statute. The governor doesn't have the power. The legislature does, but the governor doesn't have the power to use revenues that, by statute, uh, are are designated for one area uh, in another area. Right, right. Uh, there was another question. Um, uh, there's a comment, I guess, but with Ken, uh, Governor Dunleavy should act as if he has the majority in the legislature for presenting his budget. See what happens, but start with what he wants. Which, if I was, if it was me. That's what I would do at this point. I mean, let's face it. I mean, he's probably going to face a recall when everything unlocks anyway, everything else. If you're going to do it, you might as well at least do some good while you're there, uh, and you might as well start with what you want. I mean, that's kind of the direction I think things should go. Yeah, and and the consequence, so that would be the, the in, in my perfect world, that would be come out for the budget uh, discussion with the 16, 20, you know, 21, whatever you've got. Uh, standing behind you, 
uh, the, the, that will trigger two things. One, the legislature will, will org- both bodies of the legislature will organize with bipartisan majorities that will be working against you your your entire term, I, I, your, your entire uh, session, and that's two years. I mean, that's the re- remainder of your first term as governor. Um, and two, it'll trigger the recall, and uh, and you'll have uh, the potential that uh, that they'll get enough signatures now to. Uh, uh, to, to force you into recall. Yeah, you know, some people want want the governor to, to stand up and do that and, you know, and, and argue that that's what he was elected to do. And he said he was going to have a full PFD, and to have a full PFD, you got to have these spending cuts, and and that's what, you know, stand up and do it. Stand up and do what you campaigned on in uh, in, in 2018. But, but, you know, the reality is he's not going to be able to achieve it. He's not going to be able to get the revenue side things that he needs uh, to be able to do the uh, 20, uh, 2019 budget, uh, and 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 what are you going to have? What are you going to have to? What are you going to have done? <coughs> excuse me. In doing that, you're going to trigger the legislature against you, and you're going to have triggered the trigger the recall. So, you know, I can see the calculation of the governor's office going. Uh, why do we want to do that to ourselves? Why do we want to have a hostile legislature for two years? Why do we want to put Br- Bryce Edgman back in the speaker's uh, uh, seat? Uh, why do we want uh, a bipartisan majority? Why do we why do we want a bipartisan majority in the uh, in the in the Senate? Um, and why and 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 how do we fight this recall thing for two years? Um, so I can see, <coughs> excuse me, the realist saying. Just don't do that. I mean, just you accept the will of the people as it, as it showed up in this election cycle, which is, frankly, a more purplish legislature overall than what you had before. Accept the will of the people uh, and deal with that uh, through a 2020 budget. I, it's, I, you know, it's, it's it, do you want to be Spartacus and, and go in with your, you know, your 300 and fight the battle? Uh, or do you want to uh, be, uh, be somebody else and... Uh, uh, and and live to fight another potentially live to fight another day. Uh, it's just a huge call, as I say. It's a fork in the fork in the road call. This is what it boils down to, me, Brad. And you can tell me whether I'm just being naive or or uh, or maybe cynical or maybe both. I don't know if you can be both at the same time. But I, I think somebody just has to nut up. Basically, somebody has to grab their bootstraps and pull hard and be the one to take the first stand. And uh, and, you know, and have the political courage to stand up, like you said, as a legislator, grab it, gather your 16 friends and be the and be the lightning rod that draws them all together. Or, uh, you know, has to be the governor that that takes the hard stand and tries to organize the troops in the way that needs to be happened. But somebody has got to have the political will to let the chips fall where they may and say, this is the answer that I've come up with. Deal with it. Or give me a better approach, and 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 I, I just don't see it at this point yet. Yeah, it's 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 the governor. The governor's got to do it. I mean, voters, voters in 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 districts like Cog Hills, uh, Jennifer Johnson's, uh, Kathy Geisel's, Chuck Cops, voters said, "Look, governor, we want something different than the road we've been going down, and we're going to give you representatives to do that." Now. The, the the problem is he doesn't have twenty one plus eleven <laughs> to do that, but he's got these 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 committed uh, uh, legislators uh, in these districts. And if it were me, that's I mean that's an asset that voters have given me. They haven't given me twenty one plus eleven, but they've given me sixteen plus uh, some uh, fairly strong uh, in favor of in favor of deep cuts. That's an asset, and and I. It, if it were me, I would use that asset full well knowing that it's going to result in an organization of both legislative bodies against me, full well knowing that uh, uh, that it's going to reignite uh, the recall petition. But I would use that asset uh, as, as trading stock. I mean, I, nobody should realistically think if the governor goes out there and says we're going to cut a billion dollars from the budget, no one or a billion and a half or 2.4 – Nobody should realistic think that's that's going to be the end result. But using that asset, saying, you know, by gosh, I'm going to cut a huge amount here, guys, unless you deal with me, uh, is, is a great asset. And then the governor can trade, you know, okay, I'm not going to cut a billion. I'm going to cut a little bit less, but we're going to use a, a better. We're going to we're going to preserve a significant part of the PFD. We're going to use a little better. Uh, broad-based uh, uh, revenue to, to, to close this deficit. We're going to get a constitutional amendment 
on uh, on curbing spending. We're going to get a constitutional amendment on constitutionalizing the PFD. We're going to consider what the what the permanent fund corporate. You have trading stock if you if you say, you know, I've got these 16 behind me and I'm going to use it. I'm going to use this asset if uh, if you don't deal with me. If you if you don't use that asset, a you're gonna you're gonna really piss off your base. Uh, but b what are you going to trade with? I mean, uh, you're, you're going to go out there and you're going to say, I'm going to have a 2020 budget, normalized budget. Yeah, there's this huge revenue gap. I don't have a solution for it. The legislature is going to say, well, we do. It's going to be PFD cuts or PFD elimination. You don't really have any trading bait at that point. You really, you're not coming from a strong position. You're just saying, yeah, uh, 2020 budget, you guys sort of figure it out. It's all on you. And they'll say, fine, we'll do PFD cuts. I, it, I, the voters have given him an asset. Voters, I mean, it's not the 21 plus 11. It's not what they wanted starting in the campaign. But but he's got 16 plus, and that's under the Alaska Constitution. That's a heck of an asset. And and he needs to use that uh, as trading bait. At the same time, people listening on this program and elsewhere need to understand that's not where it's going to end up. I mean, he's not he's not going to he, he's not going to successfully get um, uh, those 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 deep cuts. But it's but it's 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 important, I think, uh, to use that asset both for polit- for his political base purposes, as well as you know having some influence on on where this where this is going. So I'll give you the floor for final thoughts here as we go into this next week, waiting for the governor's budget to drop. I if I were if I were a citizen, I would be pushing, and I wanted to you know I wanted to preserve the PFD, and I wanted to. To have uh, uh, you know something like what the governor ran on in 2018, and something like his governor's budget, I would be pushing my representative, if I had a conservative legislator, legislature, to push the governor to have the press conference announcing the budget that has me and 16 others, or me and 20 of my best friends, standing behind him and saying, "We're going to go down this road of uh, of deep cuts, and we've got a veto-proof majority. Now deal with us." That's going to be the strongest position. I think, that the governor can put himself in. So if listeners want to do something proactive on this, go to your representative. If you have a conservative representative, Sarah Vance uh, and the others, go to your representative uh, and say, I want you standing with the governor on this issue, and I want you pushing the governor to go down the road uh, of, uh, of deep cuts and, uh, and having 16 behind Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Our discussion of the PFD moves us nicely on to number two. Of the weekly top three, the uh, pushing for the continued PFD cuts, of course, the worst possible tax on Alaskans, according to ICER and ITEP and others, when you look at it from an economic standpoint. But the legislature seems to have no other arrows in their quiver. They seem to choose no other things, and there's lots of organizations that are pushing on that. we got about two minutes here, Brad, if you want to give us a quick tease before we are set us up for the next segment. Yeah, Alaska Policy Forum had an op-ed in, uh, in the... Uh uh, in the eight, in the Anchorage Daily News uh, this week, that I found deeply disappointing. It was it was an op-ed that was focused entirely on uh, pushing back uh, on the concept of the legislature adopting uh, taxes as revenues. Uh, the headline was "Don't burden hardworking Alaskans with uh, with new taxes." Well, we've got a 2.4 billion dollar deficit as we've just <clears throat> as we just talked through. Revenues, new, revenues are going to be part of the picture. There's basically two ways that we're going to have rev- I mean, given the limitations of, of the legislature that he's going to be dealing with, there's two ways to, 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 to deal with work revenues. One is either uh, continued uh, PFD cuts, deep PFD cuts, and deep potentially PFD elimination uh, is, is, is one road we're going down. If there's not any other source of substitute revenues, uh, we may be facing the elimination of the PFD in the next two years. Um, the other is uh, uh, substitute taxes, as we've talked about uh, on the program before, uh, uh, flat taxes, sales, uh, some form of, of substitute uh, taxes, um, substitute revenues for, for PFD cuts to, to preserve, to, to, to not put, put the full focus uh, of the full burden of, uh, of funding uh, government on, on on PFD cuts, to spread that out, broaden the base uh, by using uh, some other form of of revenues, um, and and we have guidance on 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 
the relative significance of those two. ICER looked at this issue in 2016, uh, looked at it in detail, and said PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy uh, and on uh, uh, Alaska families uh, of any of the options, including sales taxes, income taxes, a variety uh, of other taxes. PFD cuts uh, are the worst. So here, here we have the Alaska Policy Forum, which is a good has typically been a good conservative voice, uh, uh, it, and 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 worried about things that are important to the Alaska economy. Here's the, the, the AFP coming out with an editorial, the headline of which is, Don't Burden Hardworking Alaskans uh, with New Taxes. They don't mention the PFD at all. They don't mention the, 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 her, the injury we've done to Alaska uh, in terms of using PFD cuts the last uh, five years. They don't mention the need uh, to, uh, to maintain uh, at least some form of the PFD going forward. They don't mention the, the, the largest adverse. They don't mention any studies that talk about the relative impact of, uh, of PFD cuts versus other approaches uh, on, uh, on, on Alaska families and, and the Alaska economy. They don't mention the PFD at all. The entire piece is focused on don't do sales taxes, don't do income taxes, because those, those have horrible consequences uh, on, uh, on uh, Alaska families and on, uh, and on the Alaska economy and on Alaska workers. They don't mention <laughs> the, 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 the tax, the, 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 the burden that, that our existing approach uh, is doing the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. Is, so, is that just disingenuousness on their part, or is it just lack of, uh, you know, is it just lack of follow through, or I mean, is it intentional? Do you think? I mean, are they? It's intentional. It's absolutely disingenuous. It's absolutely, um, uh, frankly, uh, we don't care about the PFD. Uh, uh, we're just going to consider it gone. Uh, our line of defense is not to have uh, sales taxes or income taxes or any of these other. Other taxes. I mean, basically, uh, uh, we're getting to, we're getting down to where uh, uh, people's allegiances uh, uh, to the PFD or to or to other forms of revenue uh, are are, are going to show up. I mean, because at 2.4 billion out of savings, there's there's no wiggle room, real wiggle room left on. Uh, on uh, on taking a stand, you've got to stand up and you got to say, how the hell are we going to fund this 2.4 billion dollar deficit if we're not going to do it through cuts? Right. Um, and the and the policy forum has 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 shown their cards uh, and said, you know, we're just going to, the PFD's gone. We're not even going to worry about it. We're not going to worry about the adverse impact that it's having on on Alaska families and on the Alaska economy. We're not going to worry about its disproportional, hugely disproportional inc- impact on middle and lower income Alaska families, uh, we're just going to let that go. Uh, and we're going to, you know, we don't want, we don't want these sales taxes and, and these, and these income taxes. Um, uh, and it's just, it's just disingenuous on their part to, to, uh, to ignore the uh, PFD and to ignore the adverse impact that the, right. the PFD guys are having. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Let's quickly move on to number three. We've got about four minutes here. Number three is what is the permanent fund corporation doing this coming session? Uh, in light of everything that's going on, we don't talk a lot about the corp itself. What's happening, Brad? Well, the corp is sort of, is is moving into a new era. I mean, if you if you listen to the talking heads that talk about fiscal policy talk, they talk about you know now the corporation revenue stream is the most important uh, is the most important thing to. Uh, to uh, Alaska, the Alaska budget, and and the corporation's taken on, uh, has taken on a new uh, new significance, a new profile, perhaps, and they've just published uh, what they call a trustees uh, paper. Uh, uh, now, these trustees papers are are not routine. Uh, There's something that the that the permanent fund corporation does uh, when, frankly, they're they're getting on a uh, on, on a uh, uh, a lobbying push. Um, and they just published a new one. They haven't published one since I think the last one was 2008, or maybe it was even uh, even before that. Uh, but they published a new paper. They're they're out selling it with op-eds, uh, and basically they're going to make a push uh, 
uh, uh, down the road that's outlined in the paper. The, it, it, there's a Juno, an op-ed in the Juno Empire that really sub, uh, 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 summarizes what the what the what their paper does. It says we need to we need to constitutionalize the POMV. We need to roll the earnings reserve into the into the corpus uh, and just fix the amount that we're going to take ever take. Uh, from the permanent fund corporation, look to the permanent fund corporation to produce at at the POMV level, five percent, four and a half percent, five and a half percent, whatever it is. But but we need to roll everything together and just all we do is look to the permanent fund corporation for that for that amount. Um, and and that's going to be a big push. And and they're making it uh, by by publishing this paper. They're making it a big push. They don't want they don't want to run the risk. Uh, and to them, it's a big to the corporation. It's a big risk. They don't want to run the risk of having these variable, ad hoc draws coming out of the ERA. So they're trying to cut that off uh, with this constitutional amendment. That's going to be something that you're going to hear a lot about in this legislature. Bert, I anticipate Bert Stedman and others are going to talk about it a lot uh, as being an important thing to do. There's going to be a big push to do it. It's going to take some of the air out of the room uh, in the legislature. Um, and it's something that I think we'll be talking about on the on the program in the future. But those who want to understand what's going on, look at this latest editorial uh, in the in the Juno, Juno Juno Empire. The headline is "Opinion: Five Lessons for Sustaining the Permanent Fund." And then take time to go to the Permanent Fund Corporation website, look up the Trustees Paper Volume Nine, and read it. That's that's something that. If you really want to follow this issue, and I think it's going to be an important issue, or at least an issue that gets a lot of air in this legislature, uh, that's the background you need to really understand what's going to be going on. I posted the link in the chat room for the Juno Empire's uh, opinion piece. If you want to go read it, you can go check it out there. It's Colleen Sullivan Leonard's in the chat room. She says, is the role of the Permanent Fund Board to hoard money? Um, I mean, I think the, the role of the Fund Board should be, obviously, to get the generate the largest return. I don't know about the advocation for them not touching the earnings reserve because that is basically part of the spendable part. I think they should be protecting the corpus versus the the whole thing, uh, or at least taking a position on it. Their their role is to advise in that regard. I don't know if this is really more advocacy or not. What what say you, Brad? Uh, they think their role is to fulfill the objective of having the permanent fund available now and in the future. Uh, in its strongest possible position. That's what that's what they would say in response to Colleen, if one of them were were sitting here, um, and that you know, and and firming it up at a at a specified uh, draw puts them in the strongest possible position to make investments, long term investments, and put the put the permanent fund in its longest uh, uh, in its strongest uh, long term position. So, but but ultimately that calls with the legislature. I mean, the Constitution says what the Constitution says. The Permanent Fund Corporation Board is recommending this change, pushing for this policy change, but they can't do it on their own. So ultimately, right. the call is uh, up to the legislature. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. As always, my friend, uh, good stuff. We'll keep fighting this fight and keep tilting at these windmills until something changes. And uh, we may be old and gray or older and grayer by the time this is all said and done. Brad, thank you so much. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.